Welcome everyone to the eighth gathering of our spring Moorhead Kane event season. We have a few more exciting talks and discussions still lined up for you for this spring, so we hope you'll have a look at the NCN and learn more and RSVP. For today's seven talk, we're so happy to welcome Tony Liu, class of 2017, to talk with us about the arts of living on a damaged planet, what it means to make choices and build a life in times of growing precarity. Tony, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Megan, and the rest of the foundation. Um, and for everyone else here, uh, um, it's great to see a lot of faces I know, I uh, haven't seen in a while, and it means the world to me. Um, so just to give a brief introduction about who I am, um, I grew up in Salt Lake City, uh, which is where I call home, but I'm currently in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and I'll actually get into this in the presentation, so I guess we can just get started then. Awesome. Um, so as Megan mentioned, uh, this talk is called The Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet. Um, and uh, next slide, please, Brandon. Um, so graduated from UNC in 2017. Um, and right after that, I ended up uh, at NPR in DC, uh, where I was working at TED Radio Hour and Morning Edition. Um, and from there, I went on to a program called On Being with Krista Tippett in Minneapolis. Um, and that program explores these kind of bigger questions of what does it mean to be human? How do we want to live? And who will we be to each other? Um, and you know, the, the talk title itself is pretty lofty. And I think uh, you know, I was also questioning like, who am I to you know talk about these things uh, and give this advice as a, you know someone in their mid twenties? But um, I do think, given the nature of the programming, um, there are some kernels of wisdom that I'd hope to share. Um, and you know, we've interviewed folks from Thich Nhat Hanh to the late um, John Lewis um, and Vincent Harding and um, other spiritual elders that are important in our um, in the U.S. but also global community. Um, and uh, I recently actually made a um, career change and I'm at Goucher College uh, in their pre-med post -bac program um, and hoping to do more applied caregiving work uh, through medicine. Um, but that being said, um, let's get on to this talk. Uh, so the next slide, please, Brendan. Um, all right, so uh, the arts of living on a damaged planet, uh, this phrase comes from the writer anthropologist Anand Singh um, and in her book, the Mushroom at the End of the World, um, which is a book I love and I highly recommend, but it's about one specific mushroom called the Matsutake mushroom, uh, which is actually very exciting. Um, and it traces the commodity chain of the mushroom. Um, what's interesting about it is that it grows in disturbed landscapes. So in environments of glaciation, in environments of um, volcanic activity, but also in human disturbed forests. Um, but it's also highly valued as a commodity in Japan. And so um, Anna looks at the different pathways and the different ways that we um, as people relate to this mushroom. Um, and in this quote, you know, we are stuck with the problem of living despite economic and ecological ruin. Neither tales of progress nor ruin tell us how to think about collaborative survival. It is time to pay attention to mushroom picking. Not that this will save us, but it might open our imaginations. Um, and this is what, my talk is hoping to do is how can we open up our imaginations? How can we um, open up what might become possible uh, in our lives and in this time? Um, and so my talk isn't going to be about, you know, telling you to eat vegetables or do yoga. Uh, you know, neither of those would hurt. Um, it's not meant to be prescriptive either, but um, yeah, it is meant to, you know, open up ways of thinking um, and reflecting about, you know, what matters to all to us as individuals and what can that mean for our communities? Um, next slide, please. Um, all right, so um, the, our, the poet Ocean Vong has this quote that um, he said in an interview with Krista Tippett for On Being, you have to articulate the world you wanna live in first. And the truth is we the living are a minority, the dead outnumber us. Um, and I really like this quote because it kind of keeps things in perspective in terms of, you know, we're so often driven by, you know, um, our jobs, you know, thinking about legacy, thinking about status, power, all of these factors, right? But at the end of the day, um, this is kind of the nature of what's going to happen. Um, and, you know, I don't think it means that we stop caring, uh, but it just means that we need to care better and care smarter 
um, about the things that do matter in our lives um, and that help us live in alignment with who we are. Um, and so, uh, next slide, Brandon, please. Um, so, uh, how do we get to what matters? Um, you know, oftentimes this is through questions. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, questions are the way that we can open up those possibilities. But, you know, when we think about that question of who am I, often that's tied to one's self narrative, but it's also inseparable from one's community. So when I think about it for myself, I know that I'm a Utah, I'm a Tar Heel, uh, a public radio producer, a citizen, a human, um, these different scales of communities that I belong to. Um, and when I think about my own relationship to these communities, um, I think about my responsibility to them, that, that knowledge and that knowing that um, I have an obligation to the people that I have care about, who have cared about me and who have given me the opportunities in my life to uh, become the person that I am. Um, and so to that end, what would it look like to expand those conditions of care for other people, for other communities that uh, we might not be a part of um, so that it's not a you know, limited resource? Um, and, and I think that the second point is, um, you know, what is enoughness? Uh, this is a concept that I really like to think about um, and play with in that, um, you know, the more head cane likes to tell us more, uh, you know, which is great. And also what is enough? Um, you know, what does enough mean, uh, look and feel like? Um, and I think for myself, how this has played out is, you know, you know, when you've put in a good day's work, uh, you lived according to your values and you didn't compromise yourself. Um, and this is also to, also to say, you know, what does enough look like in terms of you know, our relationship, and this is a very personal question, but what is our relationship to wealth? What is our relationship to, to status and legacy? And how much power do you want to give to these factors in determining the decision-making of your life? Um, and I think that leads to that next point of, you know, what is we're doing with the limited time that we have? Um, once again, that's a personal question to answer, but I think it's a way to start to articulate and to form, formulate a way to approach um, how we can you know, move through the world. Um, and you know, this final question, what does precarity feel like? Um, I think we all have those moments where we, you know, whether we're pressed for time, uh, just have too many things to do, um, get, that, uh, get that sense of, oh, like, I'm, I'm stressed out. Um, but what does what it look like to bring yourself to a sense of abundance? Um, you know, whether that's through the small things or you know, reminding yourself of um, your blessings and gratitudes. Um, I think these are all very practical ways of um, navigating that. So, yeah. Uh, next slide. Um, and final bit. Um, I know that I've talked about some big, loftier ideas, but I do also think that you know there are some smaller tools that we can use. Um, focusing on what's in your control and not fretting about what isn't uh, is one that I have uh, fallen in love with. Um, and also this idea of boundaries, um, which I think can be a little bit abstract, but I think it really just boils down to saying no to the things that don't matter to you and saying yes more to the things that do. Um, I think a practical way to implement those is through protected time. Um, and also, um, yeah, like being able to fulfill your own needs, which seems radical, but it's really simple as well. Of I'm thirsty, I'm gonna drink water, uh, I'm tired, I'm gonna take a nap, um, but just checking in with yourself and seeing what do you need and how can you make that, um, make that work. Um, and there is one more slide uh, that I recently added given um, the events that have happened in Atlanta. Um, but, you know, just, I think I would be remiss to not mention ways to support the Asian American community right now um, with the, uh, the recent shootings. Um, and I think this is a practical way of applying uh, some of the ideas in this talk too about how do we um, reach out and how do we build uh, and relate to each other in a more human and holistic way. So thank you for coming to this <laughs> seventh talk. <laughs> Awesome, Tony, thank you for that fabulous overview. And uh, we are open for uh, questions, um, either using your raise hand feature or just raise your hand or just 
um, as our alumni do it, we just unmute and start talking. So <laughs> help yourselves. Oh, hey, Jane, I think I see Jane, you. There you are. Thanks, Jane. Tony, wow, you said hugely important stuff in incredibly concise time. So we're all just mulling. Um, I had one personal question and then one deeper question. Uh, what empowered you to leave your, um, I don't know what to call it, it's not journalism, leave your NPR TED Talk career and go back to med school? I'd love just to hear a couple of words of if that was difficult or not. It's a big switch. And the bigger question, so then I can be quiet, is, are you willing to share what does enough mean and look like to you just to help us think through that big question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, to answer the first one, it's funny, but I see Eric Davies on this call, who is an alum who uh, also did the program that I'm in now at Goucher and was very uh, pivotal in helping me make this choice. Um, but I ended up deciding to switch because um, I had done a lot of work that I was very proud of um, at On Being in NPR. Um, but I ended up seeing um, a little bit pragmatically that I didn't necessarily want to do what my boss did. And I very much admired her and uh, still view her as a mentor who I'm in touch with. Um, oh, it froze a little. Um, yeah, who I'm in touch with. Um, but um, yeah, I think that reflecting on the content that I was making in terms of, um, you know, helping people live better, that I could do that in a more applied manner through the work of medicine and through um, kind of patient care itself. And so I think that's what ended up facilitating my choice to make that switch. Um, and it's been incredibly rewarding so far, um, a bit with a lot of studying. <laughs> um, and I think to the second um, question, um, so much of, I think that matter of enoughness is a felt quality that is often uh, hard to get in touch with. Um, but I think that we know when, when things are enough. And I think how this looks like on a, just a daily matter is, um, you know, I can go to bed saying, wow, I put in a good day's work. Um, I might not know what's going to happen, but I can rest knowing that I'm uh, stuck to my values and I am uh, uh, proud of what I have done. Um, and I think that's a continual process that we do um, each and every day. But I do think that um, it's a way that we can stay grounded and um, in alignment with you know, what matters. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Tom Morris has a question for you next. Unmute, the first rule of Zoom. Uh, Tony, I was trying to be quiet tonight, so I wrote a, a comment in the chat, a question in the chat, but then Megan came on and said, you got to ask this yourself. So here we go. First of all, thank you. Great stuff you're talking about, super stuff. Let me read my chat qu a question so I remember what it was. I learned from a book I did on Steve Jobs a few years ago. It was called Socrates in Silicon Valley, available at Amazon, uh, that we should say, no in wise in, in we should say no in abundance so we can say yes in wise measure but here's my question for you in a culture where we've been encouraged for decades to live full throttle where nothing succeeds like excess how do we put on the brakes how do we get the message out that more is not always better, that bigger is not always better. How do we give people culture-wide, which is the scale we need to affect, how, how do we give people a sense of this concept of enough that's meant a lot to me for decades, and I know it means a lot to you, but how do we make it contagious for more people? Uh, yeah, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think there's part of me that wants to say there are certain things that when you don't have the brakes on that you know feel good. Um, and so I think to that end, when 
the brakes are off and you're going full throttle to what matters to you, uh, that's a different quality than uh, going full throttle just to go full throttle, right? Just because we've been told to go full throttle. Right. Um, and I think that question of how do we bring this back to kind of a larger cultural shift, uh, I think is really tied to, you know, the question of what do we care about and what matters on a societal level. Um, and I think it's a, it's a really hard shift, but it's one that has to be done through, uh, you know, behavior change, like, and hopefully that, you know, is seen and adopted by others. And for example, um, you know, with cooking, like our relationship with food, uh, you know, so often it's, I just need to get some nutrients into my body so I can go on to do the next thing versus, you know, what is a relationship with food that is slower, that is, uh, you know, more cultivated to, you know, how we relate to kind of the, the natural world and, um, you know, non-human life. Um, and, you know, you have to make that choice to live in that way. Um, I think that it's, it can be complicated in the sense that, you, you know, we have to ask who gets to make these choices, who has the time to do these things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why I am a little wary of being prescriptive because I think there are people in certain conditions in our society and in our world that aren't afforded that luxury and um, wanting to be sensitive to them. But I do think um, the more that we can create a systemic condition for people to have that time to do these things, um, the better off that will be. So uh, to that, and I don't know, there, maybe that's a policy matter. Uh, maybe there's, there's a culture bit for media, but... Um, uh, yeah, I think you're right in stressing both those things, Tony, because it's one side of the equation is, as the ancient philosophers were often want to say, we, we need mentors, uh, we need examples. And, you know, the whole influencer culture we're living in now, making explicit what's been implicit for a long time, it's important for people like you and people like everybody who's on the Zoom tonight to try to have their individual influence but you're right that we need to think about structural things as well. Individual influence can only go so far. And, uh, but if we're spurred on to do what we can do as individuals, then uh, it, it makes it easier to move toward policy that will make structural changes. So, I mean, thank you for what you're continuing to do. I, I know you've worked behind the scenes to make so many important things happen to broadcast the right values in, in the podcast and the radio realm. And now even that you, even when you're doing something else, here you are still speaking out for the right values. And you're a great example for your cousins here. Thanks for doing this. Keep it up. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Tony, I wanna, I wanna jump in. Uh, I will ask a question, but first of all, I wanna give a shout out to a class of 17 and see a couple of familiar faces and also um, the foundation might be happy to hear Emily, Tony and I were the same finals weekend group. So all three of us back together about eight years later. So that's a, a happy thing to happen in the middle of my week. Um, but anyway, Tony, first of all, I love you. I hope you're doing well. Um, and secondly, I know we have a lot of uh, scholars on the call and probably some scholars that will watch this um, afterwards. And with your new wisdom of our mid twenties life thus far and what you've spoken about today, what kind of advice would you have for current students um, kind of in the, area, the areas that you've spoken about in your, in your presentation today? Mm. Amy, it's so good to see you, uh, love you. Um, I think, you know, I don't want this to sound pat, but I do think it is, it's so true. And it's the matter of uh, just having compassion for yourself and whatever you're trying to do. Um, I mean, the matter of the fact is uh, like things are challenging, um, especially if you wanna pursue certain paths uh, that you know, are uncertain. Um, in your 20s, there's so much of figuring out like, who am I, what am I about, um, who do I wanna become? Um, and it's always an iterative process that involves a lot of failure and a lot of uh, doubt and a lot of really complicated and difficult emotions. Um, but I think that if you can stay present with those all and to know that the fact that you are still striving and that you're still um, desiring is, uh, 
means that you're alive and that you have a certain vitality. And um, that means so much uh, to, you know, what this whole thing is about. So um, I think to the extent that you can stay close to that, that fire uh, in whatever form that it looks and takes shape um, and keeping it um, precious and, and sacred is, uh, um, yeah, is, is one thing. <laughs> Um, Thank you, Tony. I also I also have a question. I'm sorry, I, I came a bit late. I'm also class of 17, and I've never been to any of these. I've wanted to go to them, but then I saw Tony, and I was like, gotta go to this one. Um, gotta see Tony because I really just think Tony is um, very wise yet very gentle. You know, gentle with your wisdom. And so that's what my question is about, kind of um, relating to Tom's question you know, in this influencer culture, how do we create these good values? And, you know, Tony's response was about um, how you don't want to be prescriptive. And that's kind of what my question is um, about, because, um, you know, I'm totally on Tony's vibe with this, with, you know, um, appreciating the small things in life, especially with our, our planet being so damaged and, you know, so um, precious. I since college, I've become really into birding and bird watching, um, and I found this as something that helps me meditate and and be calm, but also to appreciate the natural world. And it's gotten me even more interested in you know our environment because every almost every bird species in the U.S. is decreasing. We've lost about forty percent of our birds since the seventies. Um, but I want to learn from Tony about how we kind of ha have our values. Um, without forcing them on others. Because sometimes I can be um, really passionate and I need to understand that some people, you know, don't feel the same way about birds. Like I live in New York City and I found an injured pigeon and I brought it into my home and my roommates were so angry. They're like, oh, it spreads disease. And I'm like, can't you see this? This is a living creature. You know, this is a living creature we need to respect. Um, but I don't want to be like prescri prescriptive or virtue signaling. Um, so how do you sort of live the life you want to live, um, you know, and encourage others to sh share your values if, if they want to share them, but not, you know, not or really just allow other people to share their views and like, I don't know, just how do you ma manage conflict or deal with people who, who don't care about, who don't care about the earth or who don't care about the small things in life or just want to make a, a big tech company and make a lot of money, but you just want to look at birds. So that's basically my question, Tony. Yeah, uh, great question, Martha. Um, um, yeah, I think there's a few different ways um, that I think about this um, and it's definitely been, a conflict in my own life, I think, because, you know, when you feel something strongly, you want to spread it out and share with the world. Um, and there are going to be folks who don't agree with you. Um, I think just to narrow the scope a little bit, um, how I think about relating to uh, people that I, I fundamentally disagree with, maybe on um, political or ideological levels, um, I think and I'm, I'm speaking for myself in this, but um, the matter of the fact is that like, I am still in relation with that person, right? Um, I am still in community with them. And at the end of the day, um, we, you know, live in this, you know, and I'll keep the scale to the US, but we live in this country together. And um, I do feel a sense of, of obligation to say, um, you know, even if, um, behavior isn't justified, which I think is often the case um, or isn't valid ethically and morally, um, I think it is still important to take a hand. Where is that person's um, emotion or feeling uh, coming from? And I think that's often to say that there are a lot of people uh, who feel left behind, who feel, um, you know, like given up on uh, in so many different parts of uh, you know, our country. And I think to that end, um, there is a matter of, you know, what does it mean to, to hold space for the complicated um, feelings, but also kind of that the reckoning that might need to happen, you know, of uh, how can we be honest and truthful about, you know, hard and difficult conversations? Because I think that's, that's where it happens, um, that matter of navigating conflict in a, uh, 
in a healthy way um, and in a way that, uh, you know, we, we grow from uh, together. Hey, Anne Bronson, hey. Two questions. Uh, I'm along for the ride on this Moorhead stuff. I'm a graduate of Indiana University, uh, but I sure appreciate uh, being married to somebody who's a Moorhead scholar because these are fantastic. Um, two questions. Um, one, Dave and I worked in dental school admissions for a number of years, and we always were excited to see applicants to dental school who have been out of school for a few years and are complete career changers. And one of my questions to you is, um, how do you see a career in medicine fulfilling what you've talked about today? And my second question for you is, how fascinating to have worked for the TED Talks. Are there any uh, people um, or TED Talks that particularly stand out to you that you experienced or participated in? Yeah, um, great questions. Um, you know, I think, it, and this is a purely selfish thing, but um, I, I think that I ended up realizing like, when it comes to like kind of the hours that I spend in my day, I would like to spend them, uh, you know, with people, you know, like in, in contact with people, uh, you know, and I think that looks like patient care. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed my work as a public radio producer, but uh, so much of that was kind of disembodied, you know, I'm in the studio, you know, pressing buttons, I'm making sure that, uh, you know, everything is running smoothly on, on that level, but there was a level of abstraction to kind of the I think the human quality that I was really missing. Um, and I also, this is not meant to idealize medicine either because you know it's a, it's a tough uh, and complicated world as well. But um, I think when it came down to you know, what is worth doing, that's the choice that I ended up making. Um, and yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think one of my favorite talks was uh, with Robert Sapolsky, who's a neurologist at Stanford. Um, and uh, he talks about not having free will. Um, <laughs> which is, is always just like an interesting conversation, but uh, he has a really great uh, TED talk. Um, other than Robert, um, let's see, um, the uh, current Surgeon General of California, um, and I'm blanking on her name right now, but um, uh, she does a lot of uh, like talks about uh, ACE factors in children, um, uh, adverse childhood experiences, and um, just, uh, yeah, that matter. Um, I, I actually, I gotta, I gotta like find her name. So um, I'll send it into the chat. But yeah, <laughs> that's great, Tony. Thank you, um, Nadine Burke Harris. That's Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. That's her. Awesome. The minute you didn't think about it, it popped into your brain. I'm sure that's funny. Um, I, I was going to dive in with, with a thought. I love what Amy said about the three of you being in a, in a finals weekend group and just wanted to point out that we do have uh, several recipients of the Warhead Kane this year with us. I see Eleanor and maybe Neha, I'm not sure if she's behind that photo there. Sage is here, Murphy, uh, I'm seeing Guy and, so, and some others, Emma, maybe Laura, I see there and Kenny. Just, um, you know, any advice for them? I think, uh, it's, it's an amazing time. And I think one of the things you said in your talk struck me about, um, and I wrote it down, focusing on what's in your control and then not fretting about what isn't. And that's, that's very few words to describe something kind of difficult. And I would love to hear if you have any tips, particularly for our incoming um, Moorhead Canes about that. Yeah. Mm. Well, what's exciting about the Morehead Kane is I think that it does put a lot in your control, uh, more so than a lot of other things. Um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, what you can try to do at UNC, uh, but also uh, the type of impact that you want to make. Um, and I think that, that that's really exciting. Um, and, you know, being out of school for a few years now, um, and just kind of thinking about what's happened, I always return to, oh, I'm so glad that I went to UNC. <laughs> and I'm so, you know, like thankful that I was part of the Moorhead community. Um, and, you know, it still continues to be a pivotal part of my life in terms of 
um, you know, my friendships, um, the people that I can count on, the people that I, I see, uh, you know, and hopefully, you know, we all get vaccinated uh, soon, but the people in my pod, many of them, uh, you know, were, uh, were cousins. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that what the foundation and, and the Mart Cain allowed was really a, a sort of freedom to explore and to to make certain choices that I think I wouldn't have been able to without um, the foundation support. So um, to that end, uh, more does become in your control. Um, but you know, I think that it's always so critical to um, just to get more comfortable with uncertainty and to, uh, it's no fun. I'm dealing with it right now, uh, waiting to hear back about certain things, but um, uh, you know, we keep on trying. <laughs> Love it, thank you. We're all taking notes, that's great. Um, and we go from class of 2025 to class of 1959. Uh, Dr. Bob Carter has a question for you next. Uh, you, you said class of 59. Tony, in your slides, you said the dead outnumber us. And what's the basis of that? I understood that of all the people who've ever lived, the majority are alive today. Oh, okay. Um, well, it, it's interesting because uh, I did not fact check Ocean, uh, but I think the uh, the general idea of using um, what Ocean said was, um, and I think uh, it, it's sort of a thought experiment of um, regardless of whether, uh, you know, the exact numbers are more or less, um, the matter of fact is that there are a lot of people um, in the past in history that we don't really remember. Um, I personally think about, uh, just hypothetically, like ancient Egypt, right? Like maybe there are a few pharaohs that some folks know uh, who have specialized, you know, in um, whatever field of history. Um, but by and large, uh, the people who were, you know, so preoccupied about, oh, what is this person gonna think of me? Or, you know, what is, um, you know, yeah, like some of those more trivial matters at like in the broad scope of things that actually don't end up mattering that much. Um, and I think to that end, uh, we can start to, you know, worry less about what we should, what doesn't matter and start to, you know, use that energy and that mental space for, um, for other things. Awesome. Other questions or observations? This is a, some very rich. All right, I, if nobody else is gonna ask something right this second, I gotta ask something else. What's the most important thing you've learned doing what you're doing now? What's the most important uh, lesson you've learned in your current endeavors that you can pass on to us, Tony? Yeah, um, I think in, in this current moment is, you know, regardless of how stressed or busy you are, always be kind, um, always be kind to people and, um, you know, know that whatever you're going through, uh, you know, other folks are going through it as well. Um, and, you know, always try to bring your best self to, um, to the, the work and the things that you do. Um, and if you can't, uh, you know, take the time that you need to get to a place where um, you do feel a little bit more restored and you do feel that, um, you know, you are as reactive or volatile, um, which isn't always, possible, but I think it's worth trying and worth saying, I need to rest so I can bring my best self to the things that um, are expected and asked of me. Um, at my last, uh, at On Being, where I last worked, um, we ended up doing something called the Placemaking Initiative. Um, and that specifically was, you know, how do we create a space, aka, you know, where we show up to go to work that, um, where people can sort of bring their whole selves. Um, and, you know, that's always not often not the case where, you know, we go to work to do work, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes we don't want to bring our own selves, uh, you know, it's important to have boundaries and, uh, you know, you have your work self, you have the self you bring to, you know, your family, your friends, et cetera. Um, but to the extent that one would want to, how can we make a space for people and all their complexity and all their different identities to show up at work? Um, and what was exciting about that placemaking initiative um, was, you know, we have to talk about 
you know, who are we and what is our history and what is our background um, and how can we reach each other in a way that that resonates. Um, and, you know, this was ultimately so that we could do the best work that we could, you know, to make the best radio show, to make the best podcast for our communities. Um, but I do think it's a really uh, interesting question. And it's also a really good question to, uh, to ask if you manage people, um, how can I show up for you in a way that reaches you given who you are? Um, because the matter of the fact is we do come from different cultures and backgrounds. Um, and, you know, not to take for grant that for granted, especially if, uh, you know, you have decision-making uh, power. Um, and I do think at the end of the day, that's how, you know, we are going to, um, yeah, just, you know, work, work better. Um, but even mo more than just work is, you know, honor each other. Um, uh, yeah, honor who we are um, as people. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Becky Galli, class of 1980, has a question for you next. Oh, hey, Becky. Okay, I see. Uh, I'm going to read the question out loud. Um, how do you think we can use the answer to your question? What has been my experience with the language of tenderness been? Um, so I put that question because I love it. Um, I don't think it uh, might have as much practical significance, but I do think it is still a helpful question. Um, because when we ask that question, we start to think about those soft moments, right? Um, uh, the moments that really define um, who we are in, our, in the fragility, um, but also I think just as like relevant and maybe the opposite of that, uh, the strength that also can come through fragility. Um, and when I think about that question for myself, I think about um, a lot of the, the kind of uh, undeserved love that I've been given in my life. Um, and to that end, you know, what would it mean for me to, to reciprocate that back uh, to others? Um, you know, whether that's, you know, deserved, quote unquote, deserved or not deserved. Um, I think that's a way that we can start to reframe what it means to be, uh, you know, in relation and, and, you know, citizens to each other. Uh, I think in, you know, in the U.S., that concept of being a citizen is so, you know, like even saying that word, it's kind of cold, right? It's, and that's because, you know, we've really lost a sense of, like, of civic identity. But, um, you know, I think part of that work is uh, doing what, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said of, you know, building the beloved community. Um, and that's part of what, I think that question can sort of get to is when we start to think about tenderness, when we start to think about um, those other qualities, then we can start to think about, yeah, building a beloved community where, um, you know, we don't leave people behind. Um, and yeah. I was struck by that word. I just think it, um, it, it's a, it puts a different perspective on connection. Um, like you're talking about being more vulnerable and um, really reflecting on things that touch us. So I, I like that a lot. And uh, welcome to Baltimore. I'm like six minutes from Goucher, so. Oh, okay, well, I'll follow up with you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that, Becky, that's great. Uh, Kaylee, backup class of 2018 is next. Hi. Hey, Tony, it's so good to see you. It's Thank so you. good to see everyone on here. I haven't been to one of these in, since the fall, so this is awesome. Um, I'm super excited to hear that you're going into the medical world, and that's where I'm headed as well. And I wanted to hear like you have all these values that you're so grounded in that are guiding you, that you can articulate really clearly, that you are going to bring into this field. Do you worry about the moments of disconnect in medicine and like a privatized system and rush patient care and like all those things that would be not in alignment with your values? Like, does one, does that worry you? And two, like, what are your strategies for kind of staying grounded and why you're entering the field and like how you want to show up for your patients? Yeah, it's such a good question, Kaylee. Um, I mean, I think really practically right now, how I've been uh, kind of facing up to that is, you know, recognizing that a lot of my life in the day to day is, uh, you know, is, is studying, you know, is learning a lot of material. Um, you know, I'm preparing for the MCAT, um, I'm finishing up this program. And, you know, I, I do get to see patients um, in an opioid recovery clinic that I scribe at, but, um, you know, there is a lot of that 
okay, well, what is this for? And what is this about? Um, and I think, you know, your larger question is, you know, what happens when, you know, we're yeah, out of alignment or what happens when, you know, we face, you know, those complicated and difficult moments. Um, I think, I don't know if this is going to be satisfactory, but I, I think for myself, um, you know, keeping the, the long perspective, is really helpful and valuable. Um, and I also think about, you know, what else would I be doing with my time? You know, like I could, you know, watch some other show on Netflix or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, that's, that's actually not, not meaningful, you know, or like, I'm, I'm willing to like, um, to like go through some of the things that are a little bit more difficult because I know that it matters and it's worth it. Um, and, you know, I think on a more, on a spiritual existential level, there's a matter of, um, like, am I okay with, with that difficulty? And I think that a lot of like a theological perspective, some folks would say, you know, it's a matter of suffering and what it's like one's relationship with that, um, mm -hmm. that I, you know, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole because that's a whole nother conversation. But I do think that like, when you become okay with, um, yeah, those complicated feelings, knowing that like we all experiencing them and, um, it's, they're not like quote unquote bad, you know, that we don't have to have that type of relationship with, with whatever emerges. And I think um, it becomes a lot more manageable to navigate complexity. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you. So good to see you. I'll message you after. I'm still yeah. to follow your path. Other questions or observations? Hey, Tony. I don't know if you can hear me well, but this is Hannah from the class of 2018. Hi, Hannah. Hi, great to see you. I just moved away from Baltimore City, so I mean, welcome, I guess. <laughs> um, but I had a question about language. I work at a startup company. It's like everything is precarious all the time. And I found that um, even just in hearing you talk and listening to podcasts like on being like the language we use really affects the way we're able to handle handle precarious moments and feel continue to feel like grounded as people like how do you find the language that you've shared tonight like <laughs> even just in the examples you've used like tenderness and enoughness like where do those where's that language come from and how can we uh find ways to incorporate that into our own lives yeah that's a good question um minor plug you know one is like listening to podcasts like i'm being <laughs> i was just kidding but um uh Indiana University was talked about earlier, but um, that language of tenderness is something that a poet named Roske talks about a lot. Um, and he writes about gardening um, and basketball and just a whole pl like plethora of topics. And uh, he's one of my own heroes. But I think, um, yeah, just like engaging with media that we might not uh, usually engage with. Um, and I think that like, I also come from like a very like nerdy academic human geography background. And that's probably influenced the way that I, I speak and listen to things. So um, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't think everyone needs to talk in this way. You know, I am fully supportive of all the like unique and, uh, you know, like individual ways that we express. And I think that is like, so lovely and beautiful. Um, but I do think, yeah, um, On Being, um, and Krista is someone who's incredibly, Krista, the host of On Being, uh, you know, very thoughtful and reflective. And um, I feel like I've learned a lot from her and how she, um, yeah, yeah, talks to people and, um, you know, gets at their life stories. So, yeah. Um, Emily, I see your hand is raised. Good to see you. Yeah. Hey, Tony. It's so great to see you. Um, I just, first of all, thanks for sharing. it. Um, it's like Amy said, it's fun to be reunited. Um, but I did just want to ask, you know, this year has been so heavy in a lot of ways and even, um, you know, the news of um, the shootings in Atlanta yesterday. And I think for me, On Being is a podcast that I know I can go to and um, and feel like there's a sense of hope and encouragement. Um, I was just wondering for you how you find those spaces of hope. You know, you have your idealistic sort of like values that we're all striving toward, but then um, where do you see positive change already happening that's hopeful and encouraging you um, in the midst of that sort of longer journey? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so uh, <clears throat> there's another poet named Gregory Orr who uh, founded the MFA program at UVA, but he recently retired. Um, 
But uh, one of the things that <clears throat> I love that he says, and I think we can take this explicitly too, if this is a part of your like faith traditions, but um, he talks about making a secular Bible, um, you know, and <clears throat> if like the literal Bible is meaningful, then that's, you know, very important. Um, but what he means by that is, you know, what type of literature, movies, um, you know, podcasts, poetry, what have like we in the history of humanity created <clears throat> that gives you hope and gives you meaning. And um, I personally have had my own list of, uh, for me, music is kind of the, the medium that speaks to me in this way. And then I find a lot of hope and resilience and, and connection to life. Um, so I have like a running list of like, um, of songs that I'm like, okay, I need to take like 15 minutes for myself to listen to this playlist because like it's going to do what I need it to do for me at this point. Um, I have TV shows. Um, one of them is Steven Universe, which is a cartoon. Uh, very ridiculous, but I find that show to be so hopeful and the portrayal of um, human connection. Uh, and I think just building that for yourself. Yeah, building your uh, you know secular Bible, as Gregory Orr would call it, um, so that you can return to uh, some of the creations um, that have really, you know, meant a lot. And, you know, what's so lovely is that, um, you know, sometimes the thing that resonates for me won't with another person, but maybe it will. And I love when that happens when someone shares something with me where I'm like, this is so amazing. Thank you for sharing with me. It's definitely something that I'm going to return to as needed. So, um, yeah, I, I think just like building that list for yourself is, is a way. Great. Thank you. Great, I think we have time for one more question or observation from anyone. Tony, as a retired physician, I have five words of advice for you, okay? Be available, be affordable, be affable, be your patient's advocate, and be empathetic. Thank you, Dr. Carter. I will, I'm going to get those tattooed on myself. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but uh, that means a lot, and um, absolutely. That's awesome. Thank you, Bob, for that. Well, it's just, uh, we really can't thank you enough, Tony. I mean, what an opportunity to gather as a, a little group of our Moorhead Cane family here, especially the, the 2017ers, and, and just a lot of fun to see everybody tonight, and a great opportunity to really think deeply together about some important issues, and to hear some wisdom uh, from someone so young. It makes us feel really great, so thank you for being here. Thank you. And thank you all for being here too and listening to me ramble, I hope coherently. Um, it means a lot. And yeah, just to see everyone.